Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Isaac Kumi. I'm a biomedical engineering PhD student here at the Old Dominion University. And together with my advisor, Dr. Stacey Wingley, we are the host for today's event here. So we celebrating the National Biomechanics Day 2021 here at Old Dominion University, and we are happy to have you all here to join in. Yeah, so this event is the celebration of the 21st century breakthrough in science, which is biomechanics, and it's a it's a joint, it's a collaboration between Old Dominion University Biomechanics Labs and then the Black Biomechanics Association and the Biomechanics Initiative. So thank you for joining in and yeah, stay tuned for what's up here. All right, so before we do anything, I would like to go do what biomechanics is, so everyone has an idea of what we're doing today. So biomechanics comes from two basic words, that's bio and mechanics. Bio meaning life and mechanics, which is the study of the influence that force has on bodies here. So when we put both together, we have biomechanics as a science of movement of living bodies, including how muscles, bones, tendons, and ligaments work together to produce movement. So to sum everything up, we have a short video that describes our biomechanics and what you are into to hear today from us here. What is biomechanics? It's the story of us, how we move through the world, forward, backward, up and down, under and over. It's a story about technology, science, music, medicine, sports, and art. It's written in equations, steps, rotations, collisions, code, and sweat. It's full of setbacks, successes. Biomechanics is a story built on the past, informed by the present, and envisioning our future for a better world in motion. We tell this story so that no matter how we move, we're always moving forward. What is? Yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah, we tell this story so that no matter how we move, we are always moving forward. Yeah, so biomechanics is a multidisciplinary field that has people coming from all different fields there, working in the uh, biomechanics field here. So, we have people from kinesiology, which is the study of human uh, movement. We have people from health sciences, the occupational and physical therapists. We have natural sciences. We, I'm coming at it from the field of engineering, that's biomedical engineering. And my advisor is also a mechanical engineer who is also doing uh, who is also doing stuff related to biomechanics. And we work closely with orthopedic surgeons. And yeah, we do a lot of math. So we have a lot of brilliant people who help us with our equations and we do a lot of 3D math that helps us in our modeling and simulation of our, of our models that we create. So, so yeah, so we have different people who are gonna to talk to us from their variety of fields that they come at to biomechanics and how their research is uh, helping to impact lives here. So first we'll be looking at a different, uh, we'll be featuring three different labs today. We have the OGU Center of Brain Research and Rehabilitation Studies, that's the same biomechanics lab. And then we'll be hearing what they are doing in their lab and how they are affecting or changing lives there. And then we go on to the Human Movement Sciences, which, which has the Neural Mechanics Lab. And then we'll be looking at the great and amazing things that they are also doing then, what we can learn and what inspiration we can get from them. And then lastly, we'll go on to the uh, biomechanics lab down in the mechanical and aerospace engineering department in here at ODU. And then we'll be looking at what research that we are also doing there and how 
the research is uh, uh, changing lives and helping different medical professionals uh, do what they do best there. Yeah. And finally, we are happy to have you here. This biomechanics day believes in believe that science is real, love is love, black lives matter, feminism is for everyone, biomechanics is a breakthrough science of the 21st century, and then and then immigrants are welcome. So you are welcome to this event. Uh, yeah, we are happy to have you here and we know that you're gonna learn a lot and get inspired by what we are doing today. So thank you. Our, First, introduce uh, Dr. Rumit Kaka, who's from the OGU, uh, OGU um, Center of Brain Research and Rehabilitation Studies to introduce his lab. And yeah, we take it from there. Thank you. So Just one one thing one thing to add is please feel free to type questions in um, between each lab. We'll take a a brief break um, for a couple of questions for each lab, and then we'll have um, questions as long as you want to ask them at the very end as well. Hey, thanks, Isaac, for the introduction. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we, we really appreciate you, you taking time out and joining us here. Uh, I'll, I am Dr. Rumit Singh Kakar. Uh, I'm the, P, uh, the investigator in the Singh Biomechanics Lab. And our lab is not me, is, is made up of some awesome people, which we'll See on the on the next slide. Uh, we are one of the biomechanics lab in the in the School of Rehabilitation Sciences at Old Dominion University. Um, next, so uh, this is this is me, but our lab is actually made of some brilliant people, which will introduce themselves in in a in a minute. They're 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 PhD and master's students fr coming from different backgrounds, like Isaac was mentioning. Uh, different backgrounds put together. We all put together our heads and solve common problems. Uh, a lot of our questions, a lot of our research that we do in the lab are clinical based. So think about people with low back pain, think about people with running related injuries, and any sort of orthopedic condition, neuromuscular condition, uh, uh, sports injuries related, uh, related research. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Yeah, so uh, like I was saying, we work with different with different uh, populations. We we do some really brilliant work, and we'll start off with uh, we'll we'll start off with uh, Seth Seth Higgins here, who's a PhD student, who will start talking about what he does and what his, what his background is, and we'll move on uh, to other other students in the lab. And in the in as you go through, you'll realize that people from different backgrounds, people from different educational backgrounds come in and solve some some really awesome problems and and have fun along along the way. So take it from here, Seth. All right, cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, hey, my name is Seth Higgins and I am a first year PhD student in Dr. Kakar's lab. Um, uh, my research background is in predominantly in exercise science. Uh, I received my master's and my bachelor's degree in exercise science at Ball State University. And um, my master's was in a concentration in biomechanics. Uh, I then also um, have a little bit of uh, engineering experience in the sense of uh, work related experience. I uh, worked a few years as a lab manager at the University of Florida where I was um, in one of their uh, biomedical engineering uh, laboratories. And um, regardless of what lab I've ever been in, um, one of the pieces of equipment that's pretty constant is a motion a uh, motion capture system and um, essentially what a motion capture system does is exactly what it sounds like it's a system that captures the motion of whoever we want to um, whatever motion we want to capture um, so what we end up doing is that we have these reflective markers you see that on this subject right here uh, in the bottom uh, left hand corner and these, uh, there's nothing really special about these markers except that there's this reflective tape on it and this reflective tape um, we have these different cameras that only will pick up the light from this tape. And whenever uh, we look at it in our, our software, we actually just see the dots. And if we do some more processing, we can actually create this little skeleton on the right side and we can get a lot of uh, different information about the subject's movements um, based off of different calculations we can make. I'm sure some of you may be more familiar with um, motion capture systems, as you might actually think. Um, if you are familiar with how movies are, uh, with, with CGI are made or 
um, animated movies or even video games, they actually use motion capture systems in order to create these. Um, if you're familiar with uh, the Lord of the Rings, we have Andy Serkis um, right here on the left hand side. And what you see is that he has a bunch of these same markers on him. And he has a bunch also on the space so they can pick up the, his facial expressions. Well, um, whenever he's acting, um, they track these markers and then later on they can put Gollum um, on top of that. So then all the movements that he did when he was acting, now Gollum will be able to do in the movie. Um, EA Sports also has their own biomechanics lab. And uh, you see you have Rory right here swinging golf club and they do the exact same thing. So they will just track their motion with these markers and then they'll be able to put that into an animation into the video game. All right, you can, you can um, yeah, change it, thank you. Um, biomechanics, as you probably will realize uh, through this webinar is very, very broad. Um, there's a lot of different uh, disciplines, a lot of different uh, research that's going on within biomechanics. But, uh, and I can probably go on and on about the different stuff, but I'll, I'll kind of mention a few things that at least that I've been um, involved in. Uh, one would be with sports biomechanics. So we can use um, these motion capture systems to track the motion of different athletes and different movements. So someone sprinting or someone throwing a baseball or someone uh, shooting a basketball, we can track those movements and we can better understand their performance. But we also can better understand um, the injuries that these uh, athletes sustain uh, during play. We can also look at um, individuals with chronic pain. So right now what I do with Dr. Kakar is we're looking, we look at individuals with low back pain and how their spine may move differently than individuals without low back pain. So you can see on this, um, on this left hand, the bottom corner picture, we have a bunch of markers on this individual's uh, spine. Um, we can also look at um, different degenerative diseases such as osteoarthritis of the knee, and we can track these individuals and to better understand how um, their motion may differ from individuals without knee osteoarthritis. So we can better understand how knee osteoarthritis may develop as well as how um, we can develop rehabilitation strategies that actually help these individuals. We can also look at this from an engineering perspective. So at the University of Florida, like I said, uh, I worked with a bunch of engineers and they've actually, and these are actually projects on the right-hand corner the, with the exoskeleton and this prosthetic that I was involved in at the University of Florida. Um, this exoskeleton is developed for the, uh, the military uh, where we tested to see if this exoskeleton would actually improve the individual's um, soldier's performance. Um, such as having being, them being able to, you know, walk with the heavy load for a, a longer duration of time. Um, and as well as that they're developing this uh, prosthetic limb that actually uses the, um, the muscle activity in the residual limb right here. So the amputated limb to control the ankle. And this is supposed to be hopefully better for individuals with prosthetic limbs that actually walk, have better control over that prosthetic limb. And in all of these different areas, the one constant I think is using motion capture systems and also having this understanding of how the body moves um, um, during these, uh, during these, uh, in these different populations. And now I can uh, hand this off to Heather who will discuss some of her own projects. Thank you. Thanks, Seth. Yep. Uh, so I'm Heather. Uh, my science background actually started in biology. My undergraduate degree is in molecular biology. Um, I worked in a genetics lab for a couple years and I quickly realized that I really need to be working with people and real human beings and not yeast and genetics. Um, so um, I went to physical therapy school. So I worked as a physical therapist for several years and still continue to work as a physical therapist and, and really believe in movement and exercise as a form of medicine, that physical activity is what helps keep us healthy, not just physically, but also mentally and emotionally. So um, I really enjoy working as a physical therapist to help people regain mobility and movement and help with their quality of life. Um, so the population that I've been working with the last couple of years, especially is women's health and working with females. And what I learned is that we really don't have as much research 
about female athletes as we do about male athletes. So I was really inspired by these incredible female athletes thinking about Alex Morgan and Serena Williams who are incredible athletes and have had children and then gone back to play at that highest level of sport. Um, and then even on the right, that's Alicia Montano. She raced while she was pregnant. She has several kids now and she's still an amazing US track and field athlete. And then at the bottom, that's Julia Hurricane Hawkins. She is 101 years old and is continuing to break records in her age group for the 100 meter dash. Um, so females actually move a little bit differently than males do. So females biomechanics are a little bit different and their biomechanics can change with puberty. They can change when they're pregnant and after having kids and they can also change with aging and females go through a little bit of a unique aging process compared to males. So, so what we can do is study the forces that occur when they're running. So we can look at, um, and Ruth, you can go ahead and play the video we can look at the forces that are occurring on the body. We can measure the different joint movements and angles, and we can measure the muscle activity that's happening when they're running. So we can both maximize their performance. How can we help them run faster or run farther, um, but then also helping to prevent injury. So how might some of these forces be contributing to pain or injury? And then how might we be able to change some of their biomechanics to help prevent that injury? And then on the next slide, there's another example of just another different running gait that we can look at. So on the left side, um, that would be someone running with their heel first. So the first thing that hits when they land is their heel. And the tracing at the bottom is just showing the force on the body that happens. And then on the right is someone when they land, they hit the front of their foot first. And so the forces are a little bit different. So the forces happening on the body, just with that slight change and where the foot hits on the ground first can change the joint angles. It can change the muscles that are activating. So we can study these different changes in their running gait, again, to help them run better, run faster, but then also help to prevent injury as well. And I'll hand it over to Ruth. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Ruth Higgins. I, oh, this is not working for me today. <laughs> One second, sorry. Hi, um, I'm Ruth Higgins. I am also from Indiana, um, but of no relation to Seth, just a weird coincidence. Um, <laughs> I went to school at the University of Dayton. Um, when I was in high school, physics was my absolute favorite class. Um, unfortunately, I did not listen to my mom um, when she told me to study engineering in my undergraduate degree. Um, and I just felt like I really wanted to work with people, kind of like what Heather was saying. So um, I actually studied health and sports science, as in um, undergraduate. Um, but when I finished that, I really decided that uh, engineering was something I wanted to do. Um, so I found a way to do that. I joined the Navy. I went through their um, nuclear engineering program, um, which was awesome. I really loved um, that time and what I learned from um, being in the Navy, um, but I still had that calling for people. Uh, working for machines just uh, wasn't, wasn't doing it for me. So um, I looked into my options and decided when I got out of the Navy um, to pursue biomedical engineering uh, here at Old Dominion uh, with a focus in biomechanics. So um, the little guy you saw waving when I started my slide, um, that's what we call a musculoskeletal or a computational model. Um, I created uh, that model, it is actually me, um, in, in a program called OpenSim. Um, which is a program that a lot of biomechanists use um, to answer questions that we can't answer um, on by studying uh, people. Um, usually we, we refer to that as in vivo research. So a lot of what um, Seth and Heather was talking about, um, we actually look at the movement of that person. Um, we use motion capture and we're able to answer a lot of questions, um, but there's a lot of questions that we can't answer with in vivo research. Um, so based on um, other research that has been done about um, the human body and the way it's made up, uh, we're able to use these models to answer questions um, that wouldn't be able to be answered otherwise. So um, here I have a model, um, this one's running. Um, this is a model that I'm using for my research. And you can see, we can look at um, all their skeletal structure. Um, we can look at their different uh, joints and how their joints are moving. Um, and then in this one here, 
again, this person is uh, bending back and forth and you can see that I actually have the forces shown, um, their muscles, so we can look into um, those muscle forces and um, how they're pulling, where they're pulling from um, through different uh, capabilities that are available in OpenSim. So what I'm working with Dr. Kakar on is um, answering some questions about adolescents um, or people uh, in their teens who have um, scoliosis, uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So um, has no known cause, um, but they have developed some sort of scoliosis. And we're working um, using these computational models to again, answer some questions that just can't be answered in person uh, to try and give surgeons and therapists uh, the information that they need in order to be able to help improve their quality of life um, and help them get back to um, activities such as running um, or high level sports uh, following surgery to correct their, um, their scoliosis. And I will hand it back over to Dr. Kakar. Thank you, Seth, Heather, and Ruth. Um, I, I hope you, you guys enjoyed uh, learning about what, what they what they are doing, uh, how they how they contribute to advancement of science, but also improving people's life. Uh, I ha I have a question. Uh, this is a good time for me to remind. Like, please post your questions in the Q and A. We have one question that talks about uh, Yo-Yo's arms from the Angel of Shields. Uh, the question, I'll, I'll read it out. If you have seen Agents of Shields, you would know about Yo-Yo's arm. How do they make prosth prosthetics actually copy the movements of the muscle? So what we didn't talk about is one of one another piece of equipment that's pretty cool. It's called the EMG machine. Uh, it's electromyography, which captures uh, muscle activity while someone's doing the movement. So just like how uh, we were showing the markers that were capturing the skeletal movement, the EMG captures muscle activity, which can then translate into uh, creating uh, creating same animations, but this time with the movements of the muscle. Also, what Ruth was showing with computations, you can you can compute or you can simulate different muscles in different movement patterns. So uh, I am not familiar with the exact making of your of agent, agents of shields, but it's it's a pretty uh, educated guess I would say at this point that that they have probably used motion capture system along with uh, EMG systems for, for their prosthetics. Does anybody else have any other questions? Um, we have time for another one or two questions. Feel free, guys. Absolutely. Ask away any question you may have, anything you find interesting, anything that made you curious. How would I cure scoliosis because I have that? That's a million dollar question. We are working towards it. <laughs> uh, I, I think my or our research in the lab is more aimed towards improving people's life with scoliosis. I personally am not working towards a cure for scoliosis. Also, uh, we don't actually know the reasoning behind scoliosis, which is why it's called an idiopathic scoliosis. Unfortunately, if we don't know the reason, it's hard to cure something. So hopefully in the near future, but uh, but keep playing sports and physical activity and uh, talk to your PT. That, that would probably help you get on track with the scoliosis not bothering you in anything that you want to do at least. I've got a bunch of bunch more questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a couple more for different ideas involving people. How do you ensure the safety of people testing new products? Oh, awesome question. Um, so all the tests and projects and research that we do first has to be approved by by somebody called well not somebody but like a committee called the institutional review board. So they they look into all the all the pros and cons of a, of a study and any sort of safety measures, every sort of safety measures, I should say, need to be in place for getting the project approved. And all those need to be then taken care of once uh, uh, while your while your study is going on. So um, new test new products are generally got, go through a lot of testing before they get to 
human subjects or, or human uh, individuals that come into the into the clinic or lab. So we, we try to make sure for for the best of anyone's ability. And there's over like people who are who are um, making sure that we are doing our best. So. We we will move on to the next lab, but we won't we won't forget to answer your questions. We'll we'll, we'll have more time to answer Q and A's it, towards the end. Passing it on to Dr. Bennett. All right, hello everyone. Uh, quick shout out to the person that sent the uh, question about the ASD study that we had. That was me. Thanks for uh, prepping us on that. Um, I do have a slide kind of at the end where we'll bring up a little bit of the work we've been doing um, with that study itself. <clears throat> so let me share my screen. Optimize, come to go. Uh, so there are a number of people that are involved uh, with our lab. It's the neuromechanics lab. Um, here, I just want to point out a few people that were certainly helpful in making this presentation uh, today and have been uh, working in the lab doing research. Uh, this is me on the left. Um, Dr. Sievert on the right is a, is a graduate from our program um, and now does research with us as well. Uh, Ms. Maddox is a PhD student uh, and then Kaylee and Kaylee our uh, master's degree students doing research in the lab as well. So they were very instrumental in putting together this presentation, so uh, thanks to them. This is where our uh, building is. We're part of the Student Recreation Center, so it's actually kind of nice. Um, we are a part of the Department of Human Movement, and we are predominantly the exercise science portion of that department. Uh, so that means that we try to tell people about uh, the importance of being physically active as well as analyzing uh, people's movements when they are physically active. Uh, so there's a promotional portion to it as well as um, you know, a pure scientific approach to being physically active. So it's nice to be directly adjacent to where people are being active. Um, here we got a quick video to show you uh, what the lab looks like. So um, that's kind of an introduction to where um, our lab is and what's inside. So the next uh, few slides, we'll take you through each one of those pieces of equipment, give you some examples of how we uh, use that in our own lab um, by student-driven research or research that uh, I myself am doing. Our first one that we'll introduce is dynamometry. So that we're studying uh, muscle strength, uh, range of motion, whatever it may be. Um, this is kind of like a, a really enhanced um, capabilities as what you've seen in a weight room. Uh, so we can test any muscle, any joint within the body to try to ascertain um, you know, standard levels for individuals who are looking to get a, a job, or we might be comparing between uh, different athletes, subpopulations, etc. cetera. So this is our dynamometer. With this, we can test any muscle in the body. So our example here, we have it strapped in so that we're gonna be looking at her quads again. So she's going to extend her leg out as hard as she can with all of her muscle force. But with this, I also have the ability to control any aspect of this. So we can make her move as slow or as fast as we want to. So right now we have it set to it moving really slow. So whenever you're ready, you can push out as hard as you can using all that muscle force. There you go, push, push, push. Am I doing it right? <laughs> nice, yeah. then you pull it back down. Oh my gosh. Again, with all that strength. <laughs> So uh, other ways that we can use that same approach. So another thing we can do with this is also measure her muscle production at a fixed angle. 
So it'll move her into an angle and then she won't be able to move it after that, but she's still gonna pull and push on it as hard as she can. So once I start, you will see it move her into that angle. And now go ahead and push on it. You can try pulling back on it. And finally, we have an example of some uh, strength testing. She's moving through a full range of motion and the computer's One. Uh, repetition. Two. And so again, this is a unique piece of equipment that allows us to test any individual muscle. Um, and so we can do it a lot for baseline testing or you know, checking for injuries. Uh, we do it for uh, feedback from the nervous system to try to test uh, whether or not an individual um, has full proprioception. Just a lot of capabilities with this piece of equipment and it's built in as a, um, uh, not a central part, but a, an additional piece for a lot of motion capture based studies as uh, the other lab brought up to you. Um, our next piece is show how we use motion capture. Again, we're part of the exercise science portion of our department. So our students are very much interested in, um, you know, being physically active and studying activities in that capacity. So squats has been um, a focal point for a couple of research studies, as well as deadlifts, bench presses, et cetera. Um, so here we give you an example of what that looks like for our lab. I am going to, yeah, it's muted, good. Sorry, I had some great music with that, but it is uh, too loud. So here's an example of us uh, maxing out an individual while also putting on those same marker plates that you saw before. With our goal of analyzing her squat mechanics, um, a lot of this kind of research that we've done has, has been instrumental in figuring out, well, how do we perform these activities? How do we improve our capabilities? And one of the things that people commonly think about is the influence of our hips. Uh, so your hips are actually the, the big difference between succeeding and failing in a heavy weighted activity like we see here. So um, the skeleton that we have is, is what we spend a lot of our time looking at from a computer wise. Uh, so we record a person doing everything and then we kind of break down that um, full digital video into this skeleton. And, and then we analyze, again, those loads or uh, forces that are being uh, distributed throughout the body, where they come from and, and how we move. Um, another part of our study has been on uh, some of the additional pieces of equipment persons might wear when they perform squats. Um, so knee wraps and knee sleeves are very common that you'll see nowadays. If you go into a gym, you're certainly to see someone in these uh, knee sleeves. So we had a student conducted a research study determining whether or not knee sleeves really are effective. And uh, turns out they're just expensive pieces of rubber. <laughs> <clears throat> Here we give you an example of uh, some other ways that we use this. Uh, so jumping and landing are common movements for a lot of different sports. Uh, so we've had individuals study landing from an ACL perspective where we want to understand just how much uh, load is placed on our ACLs and what maybe causes them to tear in non-contact injury situations. Uh, but we also understand similar to squats, you know, how do we perform jumping? What makes jumping work? So here we've coupled together a couple of pieces of different equipment. Um, we have our motion capture system, what's going to be shown here. And uh, in the markers are the tracings of her movements as she's gonna perform this jump. We have the force plates in the ground. So they're gonna show these kind of red vectors or arrows point up. As they get bigger, it means that, you know, she's interacting with the ground and causing more force to occur. And then finally on the bottom, we have uh, readings from the neural activity uh, at the muscle level. So our first line here is gonna be the input of her quads to perform this jump. And then on the bottom here in the kind of greenish color are gonna be the input from her calves. In our lab, we use these kind of little black boxes as you see here to record this neural uh, interface, this um, uh, excitation for our muscles to produce movement, so. Jump, and then our kind of coupling movement to go along with what we see uh, live. <clears throat> then we have uh, multiple other ways that uh, persons perform jumping. So we're going to give an example of what's called a drop jump here. 
So we can also look at a few different kinds of jumps. So here Kaylee's going to do a, a drop jump onto the force plates and explode upwards, which should help improve her jumping capabilities. So a drop jump kind of simulates if you were coming from a height and then performing that jump subsequently. So same kind of information here. She's dropping from a height down to those force plates and then subsequently jumping upwards. So people use uh, this kind of technology to, to, again, see what are the influence on our muscles? How do we uh, train ourselves to perform movements like this, you know, to immediately rebound and jump back up and, and not injure ourselves? Um, again, uh, as I've, I've been pointing out, our, our students are really interested in the weightlifting aspect. So we've had a number of students focus on Olympic lifting as well. Here we have the example of a snatch, um, but certainly we've done uh, clean and jerks and, and so on. Um, but motion capture used for that same purpose. So where do those forces come from? How do our muscles actually perform this? And then if we determine which muscles are important at which phase, we can then kind of enhance our training aspects. Uh, one of our faculty members is a very elite level um, Olympic weightlifter. He's actually competed for the US uh, quite a few times. His name is Phil, uh, Mr. Phil Sabatini. And so um, a lot of his students are certainly involved and, and interested in Olympic lifting. Um, one that's been very interesting uh, uh, for me has been focusing on uh, baseball and different sporting aspects. So uh, I'm uh, very much a, a baseball enthusiast. And um, one day my wife and I were sitting on the couch watching a TV show that was um, short lived, but they brought up um, a lot of focus on the catcher and how bad his knees were in this TV show. And, and my wife mentioned, you know, what, does anyone, you know, pay attention to catchers? We know all this stuff about pitching and the throwing that they do, but does anyone pay attention to the guy sitting behind the plate all day long in this kind of deep squat posture? Uh, and indeed, th there's not a lot of uh, stuff out there about catchers, but at least we have tried to improve their, uh, you know, life um, uh, certainly for their knee joints through these things called knee savers. And so we did some testing to determine just how much saving do those knee savers do. So here we have an example of the person with the motion capture workers on, and then we're just kind of tossing a ball back and forth without his knee savers on. And then the same maneuver, you know, yeah. kind of a pitch off and the same kind of idea, keeping him from squatting too deep, giving him some relief and, and hopefully uh, increasing the longevity of them for, um, you know, short-lived time period for baseball. Uh, the final one I'll show you is a, a, um, a research study that was focusing on um, youth, specifically uh, female youth in the area and chronic ankle instability. That's a, an issue that, that certainly arises for persons who play soccer. Um, and at the youth aspect, we had a student that was um, a coach. And so she wanted to see if she could help her own athletes. And so we did some unique testing for them where we brought in some of her <laughs> players and we had them do different that was good. in the lab. Yeah. So dribbling, pass, yes. and so yes. on. <clears throat> So again, our, our students drive a lot of the research around um, the neuromechanics lab, and, and I very much appreciate the opportunities I have with them. Um, I do would be remiss if I didn't show a little bit of uh, some of what I personally do. Um, so um, I, I have some interest in delving deeper into muscles. Um, we do some with the uh, ultrasound. Uh -oh where we use ultrasound to take a look at the muscle at individual levels. So we can look at the whole muscle. Individual lines that we see here are kind of like the grass poles. We can just go deeper into the muscle, understanding where the hamstring strains occur from, measuring the ACL in a person. Uh, so we use ultrasound as another technique within our uh, lab, um, as well as pairing with different populations. Uh, one. Um, portion of the research that I do has been focused on persons with a visual impairment and how they are physically active or not. Um, it is more difficult for a person who has a visual impairment to be physically active due to basically the way the world is created around them. Um, and some of the ways they are active or the most predominantly, it's going to be by walking and running. So you see some examples of how persons 
uh, choose to walk and run. Sometimes they might have a human guide, they might have um, a canine guide, and they might also do what we call independent walking where they utilize their own cane. So we focus a lot of research on understanding just how do they locomote and how can we then influence the world around us to better make opportunities for them to be physically active. And along the same vein, we um, have also performed some research for persons with uh, autism spectrum disorder. Um, really uh, just a lot like what we see for persons with a visual impairment. The opportunities for being physically active are kind of there, but they're really not tuned to the needs of these individuals. And so our um, approach for this study has been kind of a holistic where we're coming at it from many different aspects, both um, exercise physiology and biomechanics, as well as physical activity based to understand how do these individuals move and what can we do um, to better enhance their physical activity levels. So for these studies, we have been recording how physically active a person is by letting them take home an accelerometer or pedometer, monitoring their physical activity levels, and then pairing that together with the information we get from biomechanics and motion capture to say, you know, is there a tendency for the way that they move to influence how physically active they are? All right. And that is a um, whole bunch of stuff thrown at you, but uh, I do want to open up this time to answer some questions if you guys have some. I see a couple in here. <clears throat> oh, sure. I can uh, send you some information about the, um, the study for when we open up um, back up for research. Uh, right now, we're not open at Old Dominion University, but I'll, I can certainly um, forward on some information for you. So I'll uh, write you a, an answer later. Um, another question here is uh, sometimes chiropractic work can be controversial and your labs are you doing any research that supports the advantages or disadvantages of this type of therapy or work. Um, we have had some talks with a, a chiropractor, but um, not specifically have we done any particular work with those individuals um, when we were getting underway um, kind of some of this COVID related shutdowns occurred. Um, but there have been a number of, of individuals who bring that up as a possibility of, you know, can we do live chiropractic work and then see what are the immediate, so acute responses, and then can you have someone come back for repeated visits and, and see what uh, um, influence that might have over a longer period of time. Any uh, other questions about this? All right, I think we're good to move on. Thank you very much. But if, if you come up with more questions, we have time at the end for everybody to answer. So I think Isaac wants me to start. <laughs> We're going to talk about uh, Isaac, myself, and uh, Julia Noganova. Um, so both Isaac and Julia are working on their PhDs in biomedical engineering, and I'm um, Dr. Ringlev. Um, we work in the musculoskeletal biomechanics lab, which um, is housed in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. We just took a, a video of the inside of our lab. That's myself and Julia welcoming you. Um, so really what, what we do is we study the effects of conditions such as age, activity, disease, and injuries, both immediately after the injuries or injuries that have caused long-term problems or chronic problems on the musculoskeletal system. And depending on what we're looking at, we actually combine lots of things. So you've already seen some in vivo, which is uh, data collection on living people, 
um, and what we call in silico or computer simulations. So you've seen some of those, but in our lab, the unique thing we do is in vitro data collection, um, which means we collect data on uh, people who have donated their bodies after, um, after passing away to science. Um, right now we're preliminarily looking at feet and ankles. Um, I'm gonna show you uh, knee data collection and also spines. Um, and the last thing I'm gonna show you in our in vivo part is some sports biomechanics stuff we're doing as well. Right, and I think Julie is gonna start off by talking about foot and ankle mechanics. Uh, yes, so like Dr. Ringwald said, I'm currently a PhD student in biomedical engineering, but my background is actually physics. I got a bachelor's in physics from George Mason, but I was more interested in really looking at how the body moves, like the physics of the moving body and biomechanics helps me do that. Um, and like she mentioned, one way we could do that is by looking at cadavers. Uh, we can measure things that we can't in living people. We could recreate an injury, like a tear to the ligaments, like when you strain your ankle and see how that affects the range of motion of the foot and look at how surgery or bracing techniques can return motion uh, back to normal. Uh, using motion capture, like the other labs do, we can also measure things that you wouldn't be able to in a normal foot. For example, the bones in the foot are so small and move under the skin so much, you wouldn't be able to see the motion of each one uh, normally, but using the motion capture uh, posts that we've drilled into each foot, we can measure the motion of each bone separately uh, during walking. Uh, next slide. So in our lab, since we do investigate things that are pretty unique, we actually build our own devices or have undergraduate engineering students build devices for us as their project. So the picture on the left is actually a device that using motors can move the ankle in all degrees of motion that you would usually see during walking. And then using this, we can create models to help us see what we've measured using the cadavers. Uh, like Ruth had mentioned, uh, we could also use models to calculate things that we can't measure, like in a living person can't measure the contact forces within the knee and ankle very easily. But using a model, we can change things like the angle of the joints, or we can kind of recreate a surgery technique within a model and see how that would affect the loads and the motions within your model. Uh, another modeling technique we use in the lab is finite element modeling. Uh, using that, we can take an image like a CT scan and create a 3D model of the foot using many smaller elements. And then from that, we could figure out the stresses and the strains of each element and see how that goes into the loading of the foot during walking. Yeah, so one thing that we also do is uh, we do spine modeling aimed at helping orthopedic surgeons plan their surgery for, for people with especially scoliosis. Here we've modeled the human lumbar spine by applying a torque and then we can see the, the spine like flexing. And after this, we can go on to take our ligaments and like uh, simulate and see the effect of the forces that are applied onto it. So we can see from the from from this we can see how the the total displacement of the of the spine relative to its original position here and as said the surgeons these orthopedic surgeons are really interested in seeing how like how taking out a ligament affects the 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 whole spine or the whole lumbar spine so this is what we do and yeah and then, so as you just said, we have a creation of a device. We, as engineers, we build devices here. So this is a spine device that we built to help us simulate what we do in 
their computer simulation so we can rotate uh, this device in other ranges of motion to see how they how they they move relative to their original positions and we have um we put in markets so able to track the positions as well yeah so on the right is the original um uh, it's it's a scoliotic spine that has been uh, milled, uh that has been molded yeah so it's a uh, it's a saw bone of a scoliotic spine and then we have the the model of the uh, scoliotic spine placed in this uh, device and we are rotating it to see how it moves yeah. So uh, here's a picture of a, some a study we did um, in in the knee. You can see a sensor we haven't talked about before, which we can put inside the knee joint to measure contact pressure. So again, that's not something we can do in living people. Um, so that's in the bottom left, um, and in the top left side, you can see a sensor that's attached to a ligament in the knee. And what that does is it measures the motion or the displacement of the ligament, um, and this allows us to do different things. Um, one is we were uh, validating a computer model um, and using this experiment that was looking at loading in the anterior cruciate ligament. The other thing that we did in this study was we cut the anterior cruciate ligament and looked at how pressure um, in the knee changed when the anterior cruciate ligament was before it was cut and after it was cut. So we could see how the pressure distribution across both sides of the knee joint changed. The next slide is going to show a movie of the knee moving. Um, can you hit play, Isaac? So the, this device, again, was um, designed and built by a senior design project group at ODU. Um, and then we used it to flex and extend this knee automatically in this device. Um, we have sensors screwed into the, the bones, the tibia and the femur. And you can see the sensors that are measuring the leg ligament displacement as small wires kind of hanging down. And then you can also see that we we're applying loads uh, like muscle loads to the patellar tendon, which connects to the quadriceps and some of the hamstring tendons. So the knee can experience similar loading to what we experience when we're flexing and extending our knee. And then the last a bit, and Isaac might need to play these videos a couple of times. Um, one of uh, our my graduate students, master's students, he actually just successfully defended yesterday is an ODU pitcher. Um, and he tore his ulnar collateral ligament um, and became very interested in biomechanics. And what he's done is looking at the forces um, so he built this mound that has force plates from actually from Dr. Bennett's lab uh, embedded in it. And he's looking at the forces uh, under the legs and how they relate to both pitch velocity um, as well as torque about the elbow. So the, the pitcher is also wearing an instrumented sleeve that can look at the elbow torque um, and has found that um, the area under the force time curve is actually um, the bigger that is, the better it's related to the pitch velocity. And you can see that in the next slide. Um, so one of the questions in his defense was if doing this study has improved his pitching and his answer to that was yes. So um, we have some real time research that's actually helping um, our ODU baseball team. Um, and this last thing is just a picture from our lab meetings. We collaborate a lot with um, both of the labs you've seen. So you can see a picture of, of Dr. Bennett, um, Ms. Maddox, who's uh, primarily in Dr. Bennett's lab, um, as well as Dr. Bawab, who's another professor in our department. And you can see Isaac and Julia and a couple of our other students, um, Nathan Holland and Jin Kim. All right, so that wraps up our presentation. Does anyone have any questions for us or general questions for either lab? Uh, 
Um, so somebody asked, is a machine custom built for every different type of joint ligament muscle that has to be tested or some multi-purpose? In our lab, we pretty much build devices that are um, custom for each joint. You can buy some very expensive robotic um, testing devices that can be adapted for multiple joints. Um, but we don't necessarily have the funding to do that. Um, and it works out to be a really good learning experience for our engineering students to design and develop um, devices. Uh, so currently, uh, we have a senior design group who's actually working um, with somebody in exercise science to develop a portable dynamometer. So the device that um, Dr. Bennett showed measuring leg strength, um, we're working on creating one that's portable. So. Um, another professor in exercise science can take it out and measure strength in first responders. So it's a really good learning experience. So it kind of works for us that way. So we are super happy that you were here. Um, this uh, technically uh, National Biomechanics Day you may have seen uh, is April 7th, but since our, our local schools were on spring break last week, we decided to do this event um, today. Um, but we have a continuation of this event um, that's sponsored by the Biomechanics Initiative, which um, is really focused on getting, uh, or it's also connected to the Black Biomechanics Association, um, where we're going to be doing an activity hour next Wednesday um, at 7 p.m. And Isaac can talk to you a little bit more about if you're interested in joining that activity, how you can um, register and get supplies to participate. All right, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Yeah, so as Dr. Ringlip said, we're going to have an activity on next Wednesday. That's at 7 p.m. So if you are interested, uh, I, I would forward the, the link for registration to the teachers and to everyone who is here. And then they can give it to the state campus it on to the students here. So we we are accepting a registration from now until Monday, that's the 19th. Yeah. So kindly register before then you get you're gonna have supplies and that there will be special awards for people who come out with great designs here. So this is a biomechanics related activity. And then we have um, high school students from from all over and was also joining us also. If you want to join or if you want to register, uh, I would send this flyer with registration links to the teachers and they can pass it on to the students. So thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah. All right, so on this note, I would want to thank everyone for being here. I would want to thank uh, the, the students who were here for, and the panelists as well, Dr. Rangley, Dr. Kaka, Dr. Bennett, uh, Ruth Higgins, Heather Hamilton, Seth Higgins, and uh, our support from the ODU Distance Learning yeah, and Julia as well. Yeah. So thank you very much. And yeah, I hope that we are going to like what we've learned here, we're going to have an, a great inspiration and pursue biomechanics in the near future. And OD is also is always an option for, we have a lot of gay biome uh, biomechanics research labs here. So feel free to, to, to look for it and to, yeah, to look at that, to look us up on uh, online and just contact us if you have any questions or any, any consent here. Thank you very much. And yeah. Dr. Rangley, do you have anything to add? Or, yeah. Nope, I think we're I think we're done. If we have no more questions, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and hopefully yeah. next year we'll have a live National Biomechanics Day event. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great evening. Bye.